pneumatic valve springs. Now, pneumatic valve springs are a thing that is predominantly now in the MotoGP. Uh, it started off, unfortunately, in Formula One, but um, so this video is about how they work, and we're just going to cut the shit and get straight to it. And it's a very simple explanation. So if you look at this, going, oh, no, don't worry, it's really easy. I'm going to make it as clear as mud. A uh, bit of background, uh, pneumatic valves were introduced by Renault in the 1980s um, for their Formula 1 cars and it has been taken up in the MotoGP and probably one day will make its way through into uh, mass production bikes and bikes, that you, can, you know, civilian bikes. Uh, we'll go into that in a second of why possibly not and one of the two drawbacks of having pneumatic valves. Uh, this isn't a pneumatic valve. This is just a normal springed valve, valve train setup uh, with an overhead cam. So in 2002, Aprilia introduced the pneumatic valves to the MotoGP scene and everyone snatched up now Yamaha, Suzuki, Honda, all the rest of them. So how does it work? Well, first we have to understand the very basic principle of how a springed valve system works. So a spring valve system is very simple. This cam spins around here, round around, around. This pokey nose bit, the cam itself, the actual cam lob, pushes down against a follower, which pushes against the valve, pushing the valve in this direction, which opens the valve, which brings the valve out to about here, say, and then incoming air can come in like this, around the valve, like so, into your cylinder, and the reverse of an, ex an exhaust valve, and the exhaust valve opens and the exhaust is forced out. What the spring is for, the spring is this cross-sectional cut jobby here, and I'll show you a picture of a valve spring just in case you've never seen one. Um, the spring is there that when the cam is back into this position, so just say it's done a three at 180 and it's facing this way, and it's no longer applying pressure to the valve, the valve needs to close again to uh, complete the cycle of what the valve train is designed to do, and the spring pushes this valve back. So the valve seat, uh, the valve closes against its seat, making it airtight, and stopping combustion going out the inlet, and so on and so forth. So it really basically is that simple. The spring is like a lot of springs and a lot of mechanisms. It's there to force it back to the zero position. These springs have issues, and the main issue for the reason for the pneumatic valve springs is that these springs have limits, i.e. a spring rate limit. They can only bounce up and down, contract and expand at a certain rate. When they reach their resonance frequency, uh, what happens is, is the valve loses its ability to be springiness. And this is um, proportional to the valve uh, spring's mass and the actual uh, the thickness of the wire. So nowadays what they do is to stop, and that's called valve flow and valve bounce, it's a bit of a murky, it's a bit of a two-way system. Um, to stop this, what they do nowadays generally is to fit two springs, one inside the other, that have different cross-sectional thicknesses. So one spring might have a cross-sectional thickness like this, and the inner one has a cross-sectional thickness like this. This means that these two springs have different mass, which means they have a different resonance frequency which means they'll stop acting like a spring at different frequencies and not the same. So when one starts to fail, the other one can come in and take over the job of the other spring that's failed. Simple as that, that's all it is. So why is this an issue whatsoever? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that RPM is intrinsic to uh, horsepower production. So you want a set, you want horsepower, you want as much as you can get, the more efficient, efficient the engine is, is measured by how much power it produces per its weight. So if you want more power, you need torque, that's number one, and then you need RPM. Torque is the actual force that's being applied to the crankshaft and eventually the wheels. The RPM is how many times you can do this torque action per minute. So obviously if you can go to higher RPM, that means you're applying more force per minute. And horsepower is a measure of power, Power is a measurement of work done, and work done needs a force over time. It needs how much stuff has been done over this allotted time. So you want engines to go higher and higher and higher in horsepower. Now most of these engines, even the engines that you might have in your bike, can achieve higher horsepowers. It's the valves that's the failing limit within that system. So, as a lot of you will know, two strokes can rev because they don't have springs as part of their um, main components to make the engine run. It's not part of its cycle. 
So because of that, two strokes, you know, they scream at 15, 20, 25, they can go crazy. A uh, thousand RPM with how high they can, uh, hence why they're called screamers. So one of the limited factors, and hence why a lot of road bikes are limited to a high, a set RPM, just say like 11,000 or 15,000 RPM. The reason why they're set that way is because if you start to go over, you start to go into the resonance frequency of the springs, and your valve train goes all silly and stops working properly. So the pneumatic valves are there because they do not have this, um, this, it, this issue with resonance frequencies because it's air, it's not a physical spring. So I'll uh, scrub this off the board and then I'll do the um, pneumatic spring so we can have a look at that and we can see how it's different. So this is the very, very crude basic layout of um, a pneumatic valve spring system. And the way it works is, is you still have a, vi uh, a an engine valve, a poppet valve, you still have a valve guide, etc. Uh, the head's pretty much the same. You still have a camshaft. What you do have instead is this volume inside here. So this volume has no springs in it. Um, and then on top of where you call it usually goes, you have this extra, it's like a valve, it's like a spring retainer for a valve. However, it has seals here and here. They basically turn this into a piston and a cylinder. So a lot of the MotoGP bikes have a reservoir bottle, usually between the handlebars, um, just behind the very few dials that they do have. And um, they pump this bottle up to 200 bar of pressure. Now this is your reservoir, it's fed by some um, high pressure lines. And this high pressure line feeds the head through here, through here, and into these reservoirs. And what happens is, is they have a regulator and pressure release valves and what have you. So the pressure inside the head of each valve is around up 10 bar. This is uh, an accumulator if you want to think about it that way. Um, so they have about 10 bar of pressure holding this valve closed. Because air is compressible, um, they can use it as a spring. So when the camshaft turns around, it can still push, compress the mixture inside here. There'll be a check valve here to stop the air pressure going back out. So this is compressed, the valve opens, does its business, and then as soon as the um, pressure from the uh, camshaft that's applied to the valve, to the top of the valve, dissipates, disappears because the, cam, the cam's rotated all the way around, the air then applies a pressure to the underside of this um, collet carrier, if you want to call it that, and pops the valve back and also applies a pressure so if there's 10 bar pressure being applied against this surface here, then there is 10 bar of pressure being applied to this surface here. The reason why this is good is because there's no mass involved, so resonance frequencies and all that gubbins doesn't affect this system. However, why is this 200 bar and why is the actual pressure inside the head per valve 10 bar? The reason why is because there is leakage. There is leakage between these seals, there is leakage between the valve stems, there is leakage between the valve guide, and air does eventually start to piss out. So you need to top up that air. So MotoGP, um, there's a video that a MotoGP technician said that they have about an hour's worth of racing when they pump this up to 200 bar due to leakage. Now with this system, it means that they can rev the bike um, usually up to the 1000cc bike bikes in the MotoGP can usually rev up to around about 20, 21,000 RPM. Uh, for racing they like to reduce this to 15,000, 16,000, somewhere around there. But usually when they do qualifying, that's why the qualifying time is usually so much quicker because they um, allow the ECU to run it to 20,000. The reason why they generally don't run the bike to 20,000 is because everything else is getting a bit to its limit then. Um, the mass of the valve being one of them. Um, it's inertia, it's, res it's resilience to want to move, uh, the impact between the valve uh, seat and the valve itself, stuff like that. Um, so they kind of tone it down to about 15,000, 16,000. There's also fuel considerations to take into account. The more revs you do per minute, the more you're going to burn through your fuel. But for qualifying, they can just do what they want. Um, this may one day filter into actually road bikes. The problem, obviously, that you can see straight away is well, what happens when this runs out? Well, your valves go and that's it, kaput. But what you could actually do 
is you could have an accumulator like this, but you could also have a pump that supplies air to this accumulator. It could be a small electric motor or something like that. Ooh. A small pump that basically just tops this up as you go, and the whole system would be fine. One issue that this system does have is that if you shut off the engine and then leave the system, all the air is going to piss out and the valve is going to fall down, which means you increase the chances of your valve to piston strikes, which is obviously a big problem. So what they do do generally in these systems is they fit a very thin gauge wire, like a really pissy spring, um, and place it inside here as well. It's got nothing to do with retaining the valve against its seat or anything like that, it's just that when there's no air in the system, it's enough to hold up the weight of the valve. Um, which again, would probably filter into road bikes and uh, you get some stupid horsepower like they do in the MotoGP. Anyway, that's how the system works. Like I say, it's a very brief explanation. There really actually isn't that much more to it. It's all about the pressures that you set and actually trying to seal this system the best you can. So that's pneumatic valves in its most basic form. There really isn't that much more to it. Um, please share, like and subscribe. Go to the Facebook. Uh, make me a friend or whatever and then you can send me pictures and ask me questions about not just this, all sorts of stuff. Because um, I'm trying to do all sorts of stuff. And uh, I'll see you in a bit.